I've been playing Pokemon competitively for a long time. I actually started playing VGC and going to tournaments all the way back in 2011, which makes me a fossil compared to the majority of people who play VGC nowadays. During my time playing Pokemon, I spent many years afraid to look at the YouTube comment section of my matches due to a central idea that was so prevalent. You were as guaranteed to run into it as Game Freak is guaranteed to ignore my prayers for a battle frontier in a new Pokemon game. I'm talking about the comment that follows the following formula. These players are so lame. Everyone uses the same Pokemon. They should be creative and use their favorites. <laughs> uh, it's so common that I've even seen this comment on videos where every single Pokemon is unique. Uh, I think it's almost subconscious at this point for people to complain about the lack of variety when watching Pokemon. This isn't unique to VGC either. These same criticisms get thrown at single battles despite the most popular format having tears. As a side note, this is part of the reason why Seijin's Pachirisu is so iconic. It isn't like it was the only creative Pokemon ever, you could maybe even argue that Mega Gyarados was actually a more unorthodox pick on that team, but for casual and competitive viewers alike, it really stood out and scratched the itch for a lot of people. Catapulting Pachirisu into infamy is probably the most famous VGC Pokemon ever. Here's the thing, the narrative that everyone uses the same Pokemon and nobody is ever creative is, frankly, a load of Bologna, for a number of reasons. Let's talk about why. And rest comes out from Cresselia. Healing and here we go. Will it be able to hit through confusion? Is the question. No, it hits Just itself. Just under a third of its HP. Origin pull. Oh, oh a bigger voice than. One of the major things that separates Pokemon from other games is the level of customization that goes into each member of your team. In an official tournament, you are given six Pokemon, each with four different moves, one unique item, one of up to three abilities, some leeway with their base stats using the Ivy mechanic, and 508 EVs to invest to influence their final stats. Once you begin a tournament, you can't change anything about any of your Pokemon, so you need to be pretty thoughtful during your preparation. What this actually translates to in the context of this video is, just because you and I are both using Landorus, those Landorus aren't necessarily the same Pokemon. Years ago, I asked some friends to help me make a video called Corsola Cup. The rules were simple. The battles would be one against one and best of one. Uh, each player was only allowed to use Corsola, and I think we banned Hidden Power Grass. Now, pause the video. What do you think happened? The answer is, our own little metagame began to develop. The video opens, and the very first match is over in one turn. Choice banned Hustle Corsola Earthquake, one he KOs the opponent's Corsola, match over. Does that mean that that Corsola is the very best one? Well, in the second match, the battle opens with an Air Balloon Corsola being sent out, preventing that Earthquake strategy we just mentioned. Air Balloon Rock Polish Earth Power Corsola defeats the opponent's Choice Band Corsola. The third match begins with both players using Protect, followed by Bide from one side and Toxic Double Team from the other. The fourth match is a complete shutdown, with max speed attract, confuse ray, substitute, and scald leftovers Corsola. The fifth match featured recover weakness policy Corsola, beating a defensive earth power endeavor Salicberry Corsola. I could go on, but I think you get the point. Even though players were only allowed to use Corsola, we witnessed a metagame develop extremely rapidly. Early on, players favored the choice band set due to the raw damage output it offered, but as we played more of the format, we discovered different counterplay shifting the format to a more defensive position. If we had continued to play the format, we would have seen sets rise and fall in popularity, depending on what other people were using, and maybe even some new innovative Corsola sets as a reaction to any given point in the metagame. The point of the story is to emphasize that just because both my opponent and I had Corsola on our teams, it didn't actually tell us anything about what was really happening in that tournament. If you look on the surface, you could say something along the lines of, Wow, these players are so uncreative. Everybody just uses Corsola. They should play with their favorites instead. And if you thought that without looking any further, you would completely miss the deeper interactions, predictions, and mind games that were happening in the format. Maybe you think my Corsola example is silly and not a real representation. But the truth of the matter is that in competitive Pokemon, we see formats play out in almost exactly the same way as what happened in the Corsola Cup. Except it's a lot more complicated because there are more Pokemon than Corsola. Unfortunately. There's this perpetual ebb and flow in Pokemon. Something strong is discovered, then people start using it because it's strong, and then people start countering it because it's popular, and then the counter becomes popular and the original idea diminishes until the metagame shifts and the counter is less popular, and then a resurgence is possible. 
This is the reason why in my video on Seijin's Pachirisu, I mentioned how sometimes knowing how to use a Pokemon isn't always as important as knowing when to use a Pokemon. In any Pokemon battle, there are a whole lot of factors that determine which player has the advantage at any given time. Things that may seem inconsequential, such as deciding to invest 4 or 12 EVs into speed on your Incineroar, can have massive ramifications in a close match. To illustrate this, I'd like to show you all a closer look at the Pokemon World's 2015 Finals. 2015 and 2016 are the years that get the worst treatment due to the metagame being seen as centralized. This is fair in the case of 2016, but 2015 gets a bad rep unfairly. Let's look at why. What you see now is the 2015 World's final placements and teams. As you can see, teams 1 through 7 had a lot of similarities. Landorus T was on every team, 6 out of 8 teams had Kangaskhan, 6 out of 8 teams had Amoongus, lots of Heatran, lots of Cresselia. At first glance, I can see why to someone not familiar with the game, it looks very uniform. The reason I say 2015 gets a bad rep unjustly is because people tend to look at this one tournament and extrapolate that the whole format was like this, which is entirely untrue. 2015 was a very diverse format, with lots of different Pokemon being viable. I myself won three regionals using on my teams at least once, Mega Banette, Mega Wenyasaur, Mega Genjar, Mega Kangaskhan, and Mega Gardevoir, all in the 2015 format. The World Championships that year happened to be a tournament where Japan was ahead of the rest of the world, and their performances showed that. But even if you look a little outside the top 8, you'll see much more unorthodox Pokemon being used. Also, after the World Championships, this core known as Chalk, Cresselia, Heatran, Amoongus, Landorus T, Kangaskhan, and normally Thunderous is the 6 Pokemon, Definitely became more popular, but it wasn't unbeatable. That cycle I told you about earlier applied, and people discovered counters and counterplay. Now, I don't bring this up just to defend the 2015 format. I want to talk specifically about the world's finals and the teams the players used. First, let's take a cursory look at only the Pokemon the players used. We can see they have four of the same Pokemon, Mega like Kangaskhan, Lander's Theory and Form, Cresselia, and Thunderous. Additionally, the final two Pokemon are similar types. Aegislash and Volcarona provide fire and steel typing, as well as a decent check to opposing Mega Kangaskhan, as do Heatran and Amoongus on Shoma's side. Well, are we ready to throw our hands up and go write a stupid YouTube comment? I would recommend looking a little deeper first. Let's take a look at the Pokemon that both players are using. They're both using Mega Kangaskhan, right? Well, how different could they be? The answer is very different. In this match, Shoma's Kangaskhan is using Low Kick and Fake Out, whereas Hideyuke is using Protect and Power Up Punch. Both players have Return and Sucker Punch. Let's pause for a second. How influential would you expect this one difference to be? Let's assume they have identical teams otherwise, and the only difference is in their Fighting Type move and Support move. As it turns out, this tiny move difference has enormous repercussions throughout the battle and might be one of the biggest factors in Shoma's victory. Shoma leads Kangaskhan twice, immediately putting Hideyuki on the back foot in games 2 and 3. In game 3, Shoma leads with Kangaskhan Heatran into Hideyuki's Aegislash Kangaskhan, and because Shoma has access to Fake Out, he's able to make the 100% optimal play of Fake Out into Kangaskhan and Substitute, leaving Hideyuki literally zero counterplay to losing ground. Additionally, the immediate offense Shoma gains from Low Kick comes up big in this match. Hideyuki isn't able to use Kangaskhan to immediately threaten Heatran, because Power Up Punch has so much less immediate offensive pressure than Low Kick. Shoma, however, consistently uses Low Kick to put damage on Hideyuki's own Kangaskhan, something Hideyuki isn't able to do in return. You're probably realizing now the gravity that one move can have in a high-stakes match, especially when the teams are similar. Now, remember that we have only talked about one of the Pokemon with two different moves that, unless I'm much mistaken, happens to be trained nearly identically with max HP and max attack. There are so many of these micro-interactions affecting the pace and timing and positioning of this match and ultimately deciding which player becomes world champion. I don't want you to think I'm nitpicking here, so we're going to look a little broader at this match. Both players have Lander's Therian, however, there are significant differences. Shoma is using Landorus Therian with a Jolly Nature and the Assault Fest, whereas Hideyuke is using Adamant Focus Sash Landorus Therian. This has an enormous impact on how the match plays out. Shoma always has the faster Landorus, and the additional bulk from the Assault Fest help keeps his Landorus alive. Hideyuki's Landorus's Focus Sash does not activate a single time throughout the course of the set. Effectively, Hideyuki's Landorus is not carrying an item in the set, whereas Shoma gets a lot of value out of his Assault Fest. Shoma also was able to use Knockoff throughout the set as a more consistent move against Aegislash and Landorus without worrying about hitting his partner with Earthquake or missing a Rock Slide. Both players also run Thunderous, but Shoma is able to bring his defensive support Thunderous to this match, whereas Hideyuki chooses to leave his offensive Life Orb Thunderous behind. Though both players have Thunderous, 
The difference in moves, EVs, and items results in one player feeling like it is an essential member in their victory, whereas their opponent doesn't feel like they can even bring it. Shoma brings his Thunderous to all three games, and Hideyuki doesn't bring his a single time. I could probably spend an hour talking about just the sets and how they influence the match, so we'll stop here, but I think I've made my point clear. Even though both players had four of the same Pokémon, and their final Pokémon were technically similar, the individual decisions the players made had such enormous magnitude that it literally determined which of them would become World Champion. If you only looked on the surface, as so many people have, you'd completely miss that there's so much more going on in this match than just Kangaskhan, Landorus, Thunderous, go brrrr. This brings us to our final talking point. Look, I really do get why people don't like seeing the same Pokémon over and over again. I just wish that people could look beyond the species of a Pokémon to what's really going on underneath the hood. So, now I will share with you probably my favorite example of how one player literally changed Pokémon for years to come. I'm talking about who many consider to be the greatest Pokémon player of all time, Ray Rizzo. Ray won the World Championships in 2010, 2011, and 2012, and is the only player to have won more than once. For this story, we're going to be looking at Ray's 2011 team. 2011 was the year Pokemon Black and White came out, and the VGC rules were that you could only use Pokemon that were in Unova's base Pokédex. Some Pokemon experts might remember that in Black and White, there were only new Pokemon introduced in Gen 5 in that regional dex, which made for a very interesting metagame. One of the most popular Pokemon was Thunderous, and taking a look at its stats shows us why. Thunderous has very good base special attack and speed, and in many ways, 2011 was all about offense. It was a Pokemon very clearly designed to be a special sweeper. Good special attack and speed, pretty mediocre defenses and attack stat. For the entire year, nearly every Thunderous was fast, frail, and hard hitting. So what did Ray do? He completely flipped the Pokemon on its head. Ray trained his Thunderous to be extremely defensive. He invested heavily into HP and defense and used the bold nature, boosting his defense even more. He also ran the Charty Berry to help Thunderous survive one of the most common offensive types in Rock. For moves, Ray decided to take advantage of Thunderous's Prankster ability, running the moves Thunder Wave, Taunt, Thunderbolt, and Hidden Power Ice. This Thunderous is probably the single most influential Pokemon within VGC ever. It forever changed the way the Pokemon was played. Ray convincingly won the World Championships in 2011, and people were shocked by the efficacy of his Thunderous as a support Pokemon. Because of Ray's victory, this style of Thunderous became extremely popular in every format it was allowed in for years, 2012, 2013, 2015, and to a lesser extent 2016 were all defined by, in many ways, how you could handle bulky supportive Thunderous. Bulky Thunderous became so popular that the offensive variant all but disappeared. Thunderous is one of my least favorite Pokemon of all time due to how annoying this set was to go up against. This Thunderous was so influential that it single-handedly forced multiple nerfs. Thunderweave had its accuracy reduced from 100 to 90, the speed drop was reduced from 25% to 50%, Prankster was nerfed to no longer work on dark types, Thunder Wave was nerfed by making electric types immune to paralysis, Swagger's accuracy was nerfed, and Confusion was nerfed from 50% to 33%. Also, terrains were made viable in 2017, with two of the terrains shutting down most of Thunderous' support options completely. Obviously, we can't say with certainty what actually caused these nerfs, but I think it's extremely likely that Thunderous was a driving factor, as was Aaron Zhang. And paralyzed, but it hits itself in its own confusion. And feels yes, like it. it is. That's Cresselia and Rotom are both unable to move. And you can see the look on Aaron's able to face. Get the right attack off. No! It hits itself in its confusion! Thunderous would eventually make a resurgence in late 2020, early 2021, but in a completely new role. Thanks to the ability capsule, all Pokemon have access to their hidden abilities. This, in conjunction with Dynamax and the prevalence of stat drops, led to a physical, defiant Thunderous set that used the Life Orb or Assault Vest rising in popularity and getting good results. When you only look at the species of Pokémon that is used, you miss so much of the rich detail going on beneath the surface. There is so much more to this complex, ever-changing game than meets the eye, and I hope it's clear that the stories I've shared with you here are merely a few examples of the thousands and thousands of specific decisions players have made that have resulted in victory or defeat. So, the next time you think about writing a comment about how nobody is creative and everybody is just using the same Pokemon, maybe look a little deeper instead.
beauty of Pokemon battles have been destroyed by the stupid stalls. Wait, they allow legendaries and championships? I don't really watch this type of stuff, so... Remember when legendaries and megas weren't used as much? Yeah, good times. Congrats to Wolf. Just wish there was more variety in competitive VGC. Just like the winner from TCG using Audino from out of nowhere. I don't want to see another smear go Kyogre or Groudon for a long time. Boring as f These matches are so boring though. And it's always the same Pokemon. Only seeing the Groudon everyone uses Pokemon Groudon Mega Quasar and Mega Quasa and Mega Quasa. And Mega Quasa. Two extra Mega World Champions. The game becomes a matter of luck. Primals and Mega Rayquaza. Unhappy face. But yay! Hitmontop! Let the most OP Pokemon, Mega Rayquaza, be allowed. If you don't have him, you are at a disadvantage. Okay, why do these nerds take so long to choose their move? It's like an actual episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! They forgot about love for Pokemon and used them as tools for battle. I'm sure they were once like me going through the Elite Four with the worst team. This is not what Pokemon battles used to be. I mean, using legendaries? You don't deserve to call yourself a trainer. I always compare Pokemon tournaments like this to the one in 2014. AKA Pachirisu is Jesus. Using legendaries noobs 